Kelly Chung Dawson from China Daily, and we're here today with Henry S. Tang, co-founder and governor of Committee of 100. I have a Chinese background, you know, have a Hong Kong background, uh, but I spent most of my, my, my youth here in the United States, and uh, uh, most people all had very limited exposure to people of Chinese background. Largely in 50 years ago, people through restaurants. However, now their investment banker is a Chinese person. And uh, their, uh, their surgeon is a Chinese person. I, in my Wall Street uh, career, I worked all over the world. Yeah. I mean, all over Asia. Mm -hmm. For instance, there was no investment banking uh, when I entered Wall Street 35 mm -hmm. years ago. Yeah. In Chinese investment banking. So being very, very desirous of wanting to do international investment banking. Not, not 49, 51, but 50, 50. I have, happen to have the unusual background, being very Chinese, with a Chinese uh, uh, background. But I grew up in the United States, went, was educated in the United States. But I always um, stayed um, very, very concerned and uh, with uh, my Chinese heritage. Every member of the um, of uh, the committee one hundred is an American citizen. That was by formal organization. So therefore, um, the organization has uh, everyone is an American citizen. It it incorporates people who can be born from China, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, outside of China, as well as American or Chinese. So it spans the spectrum. And, and, and we, 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 we tend to, we try to create a sense of diversity within the organization. Back in the day, it was like this, this need for a bridge between, you know, because there were fundamental cultural misunderstandings that could happen, that that was like really necessary. But as China has risen, do you feel that this bridge has become like more or less necessary? Focusing more on, you might say, the present and, 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 and the future, um, committee, after a 22-year history, uh, is, um, I guess, in an uh, interesting position to play this, for one, a major bridging role, especially like, for instance, with institutions, with institutions like universities, think tanks, uh, uh, artistic, musical, and symphony groups. Uh, uh, to help about bringing an understanding of it. Uh, so, uh, all of this is very, very important. Not only, I am a professional investment banker and uh, I have played a role in quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of this, uh, advising uh, Chinese companies as well as US companies about China. So I have uh, sat in the middle of all of the economic development between uh, the two countries. And that is very important. It, it helps and enhances both countries. And of course, there has been was a, a very acute uh, need for it at, at that time. But even today, as we speak, even after thirty years of diplomatic relations, um, I think every Asian person and every Chinese person, whether they're here in America or other parts, can play a, a bridging role. Mm -hmm. And so we just happen to have had a group that uh, was clearly of the same thinking and played it on a, uh, a, an organizational basis. It has definitely changed and it has grown. And uh, I don't use the term as positive or negative, it has grown. It's just as when neighborhoods and cities grow, they perhaps uh, bring about misunderstandings with new neighbors and that sort of thing. It is that phenomenon. These are challenges, these are growing pains. I guess that's a better term to call it. They are growing pains. Mm -hmm. To create the understanding is not difficult. It is not to hold back and say, oh, they'll never understand, that's why I'll never explain it to them. Mm -hmm. That's not the way to go about it. Lack of information only creates fear. I mean, I'm a person in this country who went through the McCarthy period. And um, if, if, if our relationship, the American relationship with the Russians is any experience, Look at all the misunderstandings there were as a result of the Cold War 
Well, President Obama, for instance, uh, when he uh, visited uh, China uh, in 2009, indicated that he wanted to institute the 100,000 Strong Program and uh, 100,000 uh, Americans uh, learning Chinese. Um, we have uh, uh, been participating with some of the people working behind the scenes on that, and um, we also feel that um, Chinese Americans, for instance, the Chinese in America, are really part of that cross-fertilization, part of the 100,000 strong. Over 200 million people in China have learned English. Uh, that's, of course, uh, about 15%. It would be probably very rewarding for the West to see 15% of its populations go and learn Chinese or other Asian languages. There are approximately 5 million Chinese in America today. I would say probably at least one million of it, maybe even more, are totally bilingual and bicultural. And to this day, I think most of them are not being called upon, both by the United States and by China, to play a meaningful role that they can play because of their understanding of both cultures and both countries in terms of whether we're talking about academia or science or economics. And uh, clearly that it's, this is not the assignment only of the 160 committee and, uh, members. It is really possible to be broadened and shared uh, across the whole spectrum of Chinese American society.